It's one of the great mysteries of archaeology. Who first set foot on American soil? When and how did they get here? During the Ice Age, so much of the world's water was frozen in great sheets of ice that sea levels were lower than today, up to 400 feet lower, pushing back the coastline, changing the shape of the Americas. During the Ice Age, sea levels were so low, there was a land bridge where the Bering Straits are today. But once people entered Alaska, they could go no further because Canada was covered by two great ice sheets, an uncrossable barrier. It was only when the world warmed and the ice sheets started melting that a route to the south emerged. In Alberta, the evidence of that southern route is easy to find. A series of giant boulders scattered across the plains. They're known as erratics because they don't belong in this landscape. So this enormous rock shouldn't actually be here. In fact, its original home is about 100 miles north of here. But it got trapped between these two enormous ice sheets, and it pushed this rock south. They provide us an excellent idea of where a corridor would have opened up between these two giant ice sheets. They really mark a passageway into North America. Once an ice-free corridor opened about 13,000 years ago, people could walk south into what is now the United States. Well, why not call it the Big Chill or the Nippy Era? I'm just saying, how do we know it's the Ice Age? Because of all the ice! Well, things just got a little chillier. Ah! Ah! Hey, hey, I'm up, I'm up! Hey, rise and shine, everybody! Huh? Zach? Marshall? Where is everybody? Come on, guys. We're going to miss the my, the my, the my creation. They left without me. Why? Doesn't anyone love me? Isn't there anyone who cares about Sid the Sloth? <laughs> All right, I'll just go by myself. <sighs> oh. Body Kermit next time! Oh, jeez. Oh, yuck. Oh. Today's mini episode is called Beringia Was Not a Bridge. Now, one of the most important things that happened in the Americas before they were discovered by Europeans was the arrival of the first Americans during the last ice age. The people who would become Native Americans came from Asia when ice age climate changes caused sea levels to drop by over 360 feet. The area between Asia and America, called Beringia by scientists, has often been described as a land bridge. But bridge is the wrong word. This description is inaccurate in several important ways. First, the word bridge suggests a narrow structure that connects one place with another place. The bridges we build, after all, are only as wide as they need to be to allow the traffic to get across them. Beringia was not that kind of narrow bridge. It was actually as wide as Alaska. Second, the word bridge suggests that people were traveling. Actually, Beringia was a place where people lived. When we build bridges, the whole point is getting from point A to point B. So it's tempting to think that even though Beringia formed naturally, that when people saw it, they took advantage of the opportunity to cross. It's easy to get that impression that Beringia was a temporary land bridge, since it's no longer there. But actually, Beringia lasted over 10,000 years. That's twice as long as all of recorded history, and 20 times longer than Europeans have been in the Americas. Beringia was a place where generations of people lived for thousands of years. Archaeologists have actually found the remains 
of Beringian settlements that are over 30,000 years old. Third, the word bridge also suggests that people crossing it were migrating. Now we know these people were the ancestors of the Indians, so it's easy to conclude that they were on their way to America. But although Beringia included a lot of what's now Alaska, there were two mile high glaciers blocking the way into North America from there. Beringians just couldn't have gone to America even if they had known that there was any place to go, which they really didn't. It wasn't until the Ice Age began to slowly end, about 15,000 years ago, that a way into the Americas opened up and the Beringians began migrating south. This was also when rising sea levels began to flood Beringia, creating the current coastlines and cutting the people off from Asia. The Beringians were trapped in a new world, and as the glaciers melted, they finally began to explore it. This is Dan Alasso with American Environmental History. That's American history as if the environment mattered. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you next time. As they moved further and further south, they would have emerged into a landscape that no humans had ever trodden on before. There would be no signs of human life. They would know that they were truly the first people to experience those landscapes. This new world was home to herds of great beasts, none greater than the Colombian mammoth. Weighing up to nine tons, it was a bonanza for any hunter who could kill one. The first evidence mammoths were hunted by early Americans turned up in the 1930s. At a series of sites in the southwest, archaeologists found spearheads alongside mammoth bones. These spearheads became known as Clovis Points, after one of the sites in Clovis, New Mexico. Ever since, they've been discovered across the United States. Thirteen thousand years ago, a family group may have stayed here a few days before moving on. Life was dominated by food, finding it, processing and eating it. Hunter-gatherers are so active they consume up to four times more protein than people today. Metten Aaron is one of the directors of the archaeological site and an expert flint napper. He can make a Clovis point as it would have been made by early Americans. This is a Clovis point and it's an amazing piece of Stone Age technology. No one in the Stone Age had seen anything like this by the time it was made over 13,000 years ago. Incredibly razor sharp edges along the entire blade. And because it's got these grooves on both sides, it's easily hafted onto the end of a spear shaft. And thus it could have also easily taken down the largest Stone Age beasts. In a lot of ways, you can consider this to be the first American invention. This is a Clovis point that I made, and a Clovis person would have hafted it onto a piece of wood, to which they would have attached it to a large spear like this made out of cane. They could have then attached the spear to what's called an atlatl, or spear thrower. And with the spear thrower, they would have had just a ton of oomph with which to hit any large Ice Age animal. So that's definitely a kill. Oh wow. This Clovis point went all the way through this three inch target. So you can easily imagine the sort of damage that this would have done um, to the prey that Clovis people were going after. It's 
first people that come from the land bridge up by Alaska. It's amazing at the speed that they come through here. Perhaps it's that urge to explore. But is the story really true? Were Clovis hunters the first people in America? The oldest archaeological evidence they left behind goes back 13,000 years. But in Yucatan, Eva was alive 13 and a half thousand years ago. She's hundreds of years older than Clovis. If Eva and her kind managed to reach the southeast of the continent so early, people must have entered North America long before 13,000 years ago. So when did they arrive? And how did they get here? Jacqueline Gill believes she can date the arrival of people in North America not by studying bones or tools, but dung. There's a type of fungal spore known as sporomyla that thrives in the nutrient-rich dung of large grass-eating animals. The more animals, the more dung. And the more dung, the more spores. And what's so fantastic about these spores is that they last for thousands or tens of thousands of years. So you can literally dig down into the soil and go back into the past to work out how many animals were on the landscape. 15,000 years ago, there were a lot of spores, which means there were a lot of animals on the landscape. But then something happened. By about 14,800 years ago, the number of spores started to go down. And then by about 13,500 years ago, they were completely gone. The disappearance of these spores suggests animals were being hunted long before the first Clovis points. By the time Clovis hunters show up in North America, the landscape is already pretty depleted of large animals which means that there had to have been people here much earlier than we previously thought. John Erlinson believes the first Americans came by boat as early as 16,000 years ago. While the land at that time was still blocked by ice, the coast of the Pacific Northwest was mostly ice-free. it was possible to find a route south, bypassing any icebergs and living from the bounty of the sea. One of the reasons the coastal route is so attractive is this stuff. This is bull kelp. In one form or another, kelp forests extended all around the Pacific Rim. These kelp forests are super productive. They put out billions of spores. They can grow as much as a meter a day and they ultimately support very complex food webs, fish, shellfish, marine mammals, and ultimately, it's edible and quite tasty. Pretty good, actually. Rather than walking through an ice-free corridor, the very first Americans could have paddled down a kelp highway. There are kelp forests along the Pacific coast, from North to South America, all the way to Patagonia. Any archeological evidence for a coastal migration has been washed away by the rising seas. But according to this theory, the Pacific seaboard was dotted with makeshift camps. People would have moved from headland to headland, catching fish and marine mammals and harvesting kelp. Then they would move on, always hugging the coast, staying in sight of land. It must have been a truly amazing journey to come down the coast and explore these places where humans had never been before. 